Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Northwestern University Research Initiative for the Study of Russian Philosophy and Religious Thoughts uh, inaugural interview. And we are so incredibly blessed and uh, lucky to have Mikhail Epstein with us today. Uh, and we're going to be discussing his new book, uh, The Russian Anti-World. Um, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Thank you. How are you? Very well. Thank you. And um, I'm so excited to be speaking to you. Um, I've been poring over your book for the past, uh, since it came out in February, and it's just a really wonderful tome, and I'm really looking forward to speaking to you about it this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Excellent. Um, and so as in by way of introduction, <clears throat> Mikhail Epstein is a cultural and literary scholar who currently holds the position of Samuel Chandler Dobbs, Professor of Cultural Theory and Russian Literature at Emory University. He moved from the USSR to the United States in 1990, and from 1990 to 1991, he was a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and the Keenan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies in Washington, D.C., he has been teaching at Emory since 1991. From 2012 to 2015, he served as professor and founding director of the Center for Humanities Innovation at Durham University in the United Kingdom. He is the recipient of the 1991 Andre Bailey Award, the 1995 London Institute of Social Inventions Prize for Intellectual Creativity, the Berlin Weimar 1999 International Essay Competition Award, and the 2000 New York Liberty Prize. He is also on the advisory board for the Northwestern University Research Initiative for the Study of Russian Philosophy and Religious Thought. Mikhail's research interests include new directions in humanities, contemporary philosophy and religion, particularly the philosophy of culture and language, the poetics and history of Russian literature, postmodernism, and the evolution of language. He has authored 40 books and more than 800 articles, numerous of which have been translated into at least 26 languages. His latest books include Ideas Against Ideocracy, Non-Marxist Thought of the Late Soviet Period, The Phoenix of Russian Philosophy, The Russian Thought of the Late Soviet Period, 1953 to 1991, A Philosophy of the Possible, Modalities in Thought and Culture, The Irony of the Ideal, Paradoxes of Russian Literature, and the transformation, uh, Transformative Humanities, A Manifesto. His most recent book, published in February of this year, uh, and the topic of this interview, is The Russian Anti-World, Politics on the Verge of the Apocalypse, which, as you can see, I have here displayed the cover on my screen. And so, without further ado, uh, I'd like to get rolling on the interview. Um, my first question for you <clears throat> is, uh, your book, The Russian Anti-World, is a self-described series of essays brought together to discuss the formation of the current Russian ideology in the context of the war in Ukraine. In the introduction, you write, quote, this book is devoted to the turning point in the historical fate of Russia in its catastrophic confrontation with Ukraine and the West. This is not just a war, but a civilizational schism. We examine the transformation of the Russian world into an anti-world that threatens the very existence of civilization. Could you elaborate for us on what exactly defines the anti-world, uh, the value of understanding Putin's Russia in this context, as opposed to just the Russian world, which we so frequently hear about uh, from both politicians and scholars? Could you give us a little bit more on that, please? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for your uh, very kind introduction. Um, Russian anti-world uh, is uh, evidently a reference to the concept of Russian world, uh, which uh, justifies uh, the current war of, uh, against uh, uh, the West, against uh, the Western world, and uh, as uh, I believe against uh, civilization, including the civilizational heritage of uh, Russia itself. It's also a war of Russia, or rather of uh, those uh, forces that uh, uh, found themselves at the top of uh, Russian politics, Russian government, against uh, Russian culture, against Russian uh, other identity. Uh, identity of uh, Russian literature, Russian philosophy, Russian music and uh, art. Uh, 
and uh, this force uh, that uh, attempts to destroy uh, uh, the best that Russia has uh, brought with it, uh, I call it antidote. And uh, it is uh, easy to understand that uh, the concept of uh, Russian world as it is uh, advanced and uh, implemented by uh, contemporary Russian authorities uh, doesn't have anything of uh, ideology or re religious or social justification that uh, previous Russian uh, ideologies uh, contained uh, in uh, justification of their opposition to the surrounding world. I mean the concept of uh, Moscow as uh, the third Rome, the concept of самодержавие, uh, православие, народность, autocracy, orthodoxy, and uh, nationality, and of course the concept of uh, communism or socialism. Uh, these concepts uh, had to deal with uh, certain uh, religious, social uh, aspirations that went beyond uh, Russia itself. But the concept of Russian uh, world is uh, tautological. It doesn't offer anything except that uh, the world should uh, <laughs> become more and more Russian, increasingly Russian, Russianist, so to say, uh, substantially Russian. Um, and uh, this is uh, the slogan like uh, the apple should be an apple or a spade should be a spade, you know, nothing else. And uh, this, uh, of course, uh, makes this uh, concept especially uh, dangerous uh, for the fabric of uh, civilization because uh, it... Uh, doesn't even pretend uh, to uh, relate to some general ideas concerning humanity or religion or uh, social order, except for uh, national or ethnic uh, identity. And of course, this also indicates the emptiness and weakness of this concept, uh, because it has nothing to offer to the world, uh, even in uh, those perverse and distorted forms as uh, uh, Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism, Communism attempted to offer. Wonderful, thank you. And it's it's really fascinating that you trace this concept of nothingness back, and I, I believe you use the term um, a rotating zero to describe it, and you trace it back through to Chizdaev and the discussion of uh, the the kind of atopic nothingness of of Russia from even then. Is this something that we can even trace further back? I, I think you you speak of Ivan Grozny to a certain extent, but is this a, a seed that's been germinating, or is this something that's been accelerated in in recent times? You see, I I, uh, I attempt to connect it to uh, nomadic. Uh psychology or nomadic uh, metaphysics. In uh, one of my previous uh, books, uh, in Russian it was called Novoe Sektanstvo, New Sectarianism, and in English translation um, of 2002, in brilliant translation of If Adler, it is titled Christ in the New Wilderness. There is, uh, um, this is a description of 17 sects that emerged uh, in the 1970s, 1980s in Russia, and one of them is Red Horde and the metaphysics of this uh, Horde. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, communist or neo-communist transformation of the ideas of nomadic expense uh, that uh, Russia inherited uh, from its uh, uh, proto-land, proto-motherland, uh, what was negatively in the time of Europeanization of Russia, it was negatively called Tatar Mongol yoke, but uh, uh, Eurasianists, uh, they believe that uh, it is the true uh, source of uh, Russian uh, civilization, that uh, Russia is uh, a succession of uh, the Horde. Uh, 
And the psychology and metaphysics of the horse is pure expense. You know, it is not uh, cultivation of the land. It's not cultivation of uh, anything by way of uh, labor. It is uh, purely uh, special mode of thinking in terms of uh, expanding one's uh, possession over uh, the space. And uh, this is, of course, uh, self-expanding uh, 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 zero, so to say, you know, because it, it, is, it doesn't add anything in terms of human labor. Of course, it is a kind of uh, caricature or it is uh, exaggeration if we look at what uh, Russia historically accomplished. But this is what Eurasianism and Eurasianism as uh, approximation of contemporary Russian ideology of uh, um, Russian world uh, is about. It's about pure expansion without any other motivation for uh, why we should expand. It is will for expansion. Right. And <clears throat> excuse me. Is that will for expansion? Would you connect that with um, what you describe as the naturalization in uh, in your in the opening chapter of the book of this death drive, um, which and I have a quote here: yeah, the yeah, strengthening yeah. of death instinct in it's in society, its predominance over the instinct of love, rather than a creative drive for expansion, it's a negating drive for an expansion. Does that is that accurate uh, to say? Precisely, precisely, and. Mm -hmm. uh, before I uh, go to your uh, to this question, just to finish with the previous one, one of the most uh, expressive terms of recent Russian politics is abnulenia. That means <laughs> zerification. How do you uh, uh, translate it? Uh, uh, nullification. Uh, it was uh, first advanced uh, mm, and acquired political. Uh, uh, Typicality in connection with uh, nullification of previous uh, Putin's uh, terms in order to give him the right to continue uh, as a Russian Führer, as a Russian leader for uh, the next 12, uh, 12, uh, 12 years, yes. Uh, but uh, it uh, quickly acquired a more uh, broad meaning as uh, the new Russian, uh, how to say, uh, political seduction, zeroing, zerification, nullification of everything that uh, Russia, actually, you see that Russia, when it comes to a new uh, territories, it doesn't actually build anything. It, uh, these territories find uh, themselves in the state of complete disarray, devastation. It is naked land, and uh, of course, uh, this is the triumph of Thanatos, uh, uh, which uh, Freud described as the instinct of death in his uh, work uh, Beyond the Principle of uh, Pleasure or Enjoyment, written in the end of the World War I, uh, as a result of the experience uh, of this uh, war, uh, traumatic experience that wants to be repeated again and again. Uh, and this is the experience of destruction and self-destruction. Uh, it cannot be explained in terms of the pleasure principle. That's how Freud introduced the opposite instinct, opposite drive in his system of uh, human uh, orientation, subconscious orientation. And uh, visually, textually, ideologically, we see that this principle triumphs in contemporary Russian world. If you look, for example, uh, at uh, how the... Uh, new sacred uh, feast, uh, uh, the day of victory, uh, has been celebrated in Russia, uh, especially in the last 10 years. Uh, but even previously, uh, Putin arranged, established this 
day of victory as the most important uh, Russian uh, celebration. Uh, it is actually not a day of victory. It is a day of uh, death, death for enemies and death or ability to die for uh, for uh, Russians themselves. And uh, the illustrations like, for example, uh, newborns already clothed in hockey kind of uh, wrappings, you know, or uh, boys and girls of two or three years old already in uh, military uniform. Uh, and uh, their uh, uh, carriages, cars in the form of tanks. Uh, this instinct of death is uh, educated in uh, youngest uh, Russians uh, from the birth. To be born means to be uh, prepared for death and uh, to be uh, to exist for the sake of dying uh, so the death emerges not as the inevitable uh, inevitable obstacle to human self accomplishment as an individual but as the desired purpose and to die for what uh, it is also tonic instinct because you die in the womb of your mother land and uh, women uh, when asked why are you so rejoicing at the death of your sons or your husbands some of them uh, respond well but our motherland our uh, Russia, Russia is expanding so for them, the existence of the land is more vital, more existentially important than existence of their loved ones or <laughs> disloved ones, uh, of their sons, of their husbands. You know, the human body is nothing as compared with the body of the earth itself. And this is very archaic, very... Um, reductive, death-like instinct of uh, just going into the womb of your mother and dying there, <laughs> even without being properly born. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, I would say, uh, uh, one of the most important aspects of my book, and my approach, uh, unlike uh, journalists, uh, political scientists, uh, political commentators uh, that uh, observe the current situation or its uh, maybe historical underpinnings in terms of uh, uh, political events of the recent past, uh, I try to connect uh, what is going on with uh, some mythological patterns, with archetypes. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, there is no more uh, eloquent illustration of some of the most archaic uh, superstitions and uh, uh, complexes in Freudian or Jungian terms than what we observe uh, now enacted in uh, Russian politics and in Russian mass consciousness and <laughs> unconscious. Thank you very much. That's it's it's so illuminating to to think about the current situation in this context, and particularly one thing that strikes me in your book is um, in the section on the doors of hell, um, and particularly in Satan rules the world, the sub the subchapter. Um, you discuss how theology and the dogmas of orthodoxy within the context of the Moscow Patriarchate have been 
co-opted into the system. And it's been a long process, as you describe in the text, um, reaching back as long as the, the the state and the church have been symphonically aligned to whatever extent that's that's occurred. Um, but this these perversions, these profanations and inversions in particular that you point out are so fascinating. And one of the ways that I think is most interesting um, is when you speak of the prophetic writings of Vladimir Sharov um, mm -hmm. and how he his work discusses um, what you call the cannibalistic sin of Cain, this killing for the sake of salvation and deification. And I think uh, this ties everything for me so so well together and, and brings everything to the surface and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about these um inversions and i have a couple quotes here like cruelty is mercy mm -hmm, in mm -hmm, contemporary mm -hmm. russian context and suffering is the sole source of salvation mm -hmm. uh, so could you talk a little bit more about this this canonistic sin and the context of that within the war of ukraine on ukraine uh for us a little bit mm -hmm. Well, uh, Vladimir Sharov, uh, mm, uh, he was born in uh, 1952 and died in uh, 2018, is uh, one of the most important uh, contemporary Russian writers uh, who opened a new uh, venue in uh, Russian fiction. It is uh, history and religion and messianic uh, search and sectarianism in one package, so to say. Uh, he was a historian by his education, and uh, history and fiction and fantasy are uh, uh, merging together in his work. So he, uh, in his, uh, um, throughout all of his nine novels, and, uh, and especially the, uh, the last novel that was published several months before his death, um, Tsarstva Agamemnona, The Kingdom of Agamemnon, uh, he traces this um, very specific uh, uh, Russian religious attitude uh, that uh, explains uh, so much in uh, Russian political history of the 20th century and uh, 21st century uh, as well. Um, if people are killed uh, for nothing, not for any uh, specific uh, uh, guilt or crime, like the majority, <laughs> vast majority of people were repressed and destroyed in Stalin's time, for example. Uh, they go directly to the heaven. This is the way to save them. And in this sense, uh, the devil or its uh, earthly embodiment like Stalin or Putin works uh, for the sake of uh, God, God's plan of salvation of people. Because innocent, they were killed, they were repressed, uh, they were destroyed. Uh, not for their human uh, sins, uh, vices, but because they were found to be English or Japanese spies or for uh, digging some tunnel to India. <laughs> Fantastic explanations. So, in fact, they were martyrs. And uh, Stalin, according to this logic, he arranged the altar for uh, sacrificing the innocent people to God for the sake of their salvation. So he is the savior, the savior of uh, uh, Russian people. How this uh, idea occurred uh, in uh, Sharov's mind uh, of this latest uh, novel, uh, he talked with one um, Orthodox priest, uh, a friend of his, a friend of mine in my youth, uh, who became a priest uh, uh, later, and he said, yes, there was so much cruelty and atrocities in Stalin's time, but look how many uh, uh, saint uh, people are praying for us in this celestial uh, Russia. And all of a sudden it occurred to uh, Sharov and now <laughs> to his readers that this is the way of thinking, yes. He is uh, the, 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 the most cruel, the most uh, uh, repressive figure in history. 
But at the same time, and this is a typical, I would say, orthodox turn of twist of uh, thinking. He's a savior. Because if the true genuine life of humans is on the heaven, he prepares here these people by way of suffering, incredible repression, incredible atrocities, prepares them for the heaven. And uh, by the way, uh, later I found that uh, it's not only this uh, uh, priest uh, idea, uh, um, Alexei Batalov, a famous Russian actor in one of his interview, uh, interviews uh, also said that, uh, look, uh, yes, we had such an, uh, <clears throat> a terrible epoch, but uh, uh, the... How to, but there is a great storage, storage of uh, salvation, or we accumulated this uh, path to salvation through the suffering of our people. Uh, this is different from uh, uh, Muslim kind of spirituality, because uh, if I uh, uh, kill those infidels, yes, uh, they go to the hell and I go to the paradise, yes? It's, it's different. <laughs> they whom I kill will go to paradise, and I will go to paradise with them because I brought them this kind of immortality. And uh, of course, this is a very kind of infantile, uh, infantile complex. Um, I remember um, in 2014, uh, uh, during uh, Russian spring, so to say, when uh, there was uh, uh, the plans for immediate expansion of uh, Nova Russia, New Russia into Ukrainian lands. Uh, one of uh, major uh, propagandists and ideologists of Putin regime, Sergei Kurginyan, he addressed uh, 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 Ukrainians. Uh, and this is typical. We love you. We love you. We love you. And this was pronounced precisely at this time when uh, Russia uh, began extermination of uh, uh, Russians, Ukrainians, whoever, who lived in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk uh, areas. And it immediately brought uh, to uh, our mind uh, the idea of cannibalism. You see, cannibal loves uh, the bodies of those whom he devours, you know. This is cannibalistic slogan, we love you and therefore, therefore we want to uh, swallow you, <laughs> to, to make you a part of our flesh, our political flesh, historical flesh, whatever. And this uh, again uh, brings us back to this Haynes uh, uh, murder, uh, fratricide, uh, uh, which was committed, people rarely are aware that he killed his uh, brother, Abel, for the sake of sainthood, because uh, he was jealous of uh, the gifts that uh, Abel brought to God, and they were accepted by God, and his kinds were uh, rejected. So it was for the sake of love for God, for the sake of salvation, for the sake of uh, incredible spiritual, celestial uh, drive that this first murder uh, was uh, committed. And it turned out that the first murder was at the same time the murder of one's brother. Yes, because there was no other, no other people at that, at that time. So the mystery of Russia-Ukrainian relationship, the mystery of brotherhood turned into the murder of one's brother. Love turned into uh, destruction. Uh, this inversion is repeated again and again in history. And we observe now uh, again this incredibly clear, incredibly transparent uh, patterns, mysterious archetypal patterns of uh, history and even prehistory, naked 
in the politics of today, in newspapers. It's it's incredible, and and tracing how this ideological germ blossoms is is really fascinating. And I wonder if you know. It, I think it's it's a bit it's easier to understand how that takes root in a larger context. But um, thinking about how this comes to dominate the entirety of the Russian cultural landscape um, seems daunting. But one thing that I was thinking about when I was when I was reading your book, and um, as a Dostoevsky scholar, this is kind of clearly where my my mind wanders to. You have two um, really incredibly incisive um, discourses on Dostoevsky, and one is in Bobok, and the other is in Ivan Karamazov's poem, The Grand Inquisitor. And you look at how these two elements um, seem to have grown into the Russian both mentality in a larger cultural context and uh, in in the hierarchy, particularly of the Moscow Patriarchate, and in its connection with the um, with the with the with Putin's government. Could you talk a little bit about how you see, in the same way you see Sharov's prophetic writing, how Dostoevsky's prophetic writing in both Bobok and the Grand Inquisitor have come into being? Could you talk? Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, questions. Uh, really uh, central to the topics that we uh, discuss. Uh, when <clears throat> I'm teaching uh, the brothers Karamazov, and this is what I'm teaching almost every year, uh, I uh, draw the attention of students uh, to uh, this uh, fragment of uh, the conversation of uh, the Grand Inquisitor with uh, Christ, which uh, usually drops from the attention. And uh, this is uh, periodization of the future history, uh, the gradation of prediction that we find in Grand Inquisitor's uh, scope of vision of the future. Uh, because we still interpret uh, Dostoevsky in terms of the 20th century and not in terms of the 21st century. And we need to make a step further. And the Grand Inquisitor's uh, monologue allows us to do such uh, a conclusion because he says, uh, so the logic of his uh, monologue is, uh, why didn't you uh, usurp the power? Uh, and uh, do uh, the work of history by the force of your uh, divine uh, authority. Uh, if you were not to give the freedom to humans and impose uh, the divine justice and equality and so on, it would be much easier. And now people are fighting, people are starving, and this is the result of the gift of freedom that you get. And what will happen next? Uh, people, for the sake of uh, satiety, will destroy your churches, uh, will uh, um, persecute your priests, and will try to erect uh, the Tao of uh, Babel, like in the Old Testament. And they will fail again. And this is very easily interpreted as a communist project, yes, especially if we uh, recall uh, the palace of Soviet, Soviet yes. <laughs> uh, the project that was uh, elaborated by Yafan in the late 1930s, and then it turned into the uh, pool uh, of water, empty pool, and I enjoyed myself <laughs> swimming in this pool, uh, but it was like uh, Katlavan, like Foundation Pit in Exactly. Uh, later in, <laughs> in Platonov, never finished and turned into empty space or filled by water or the grave uh, site for in Platon. Yeah? And then what will happen then? This is most important because the next stage of this prophecy relates to the 21st century. Now people who were disappointed with this atheistic project will come to us. That means to the priests to the uh, successors of Grand Inquisitor and will ask us to finish what they, in their atheistic 
uh, struggle fail to achieve and will and we will be persecuted we will be uh, hiding in our caves and we will come out and we will finish what they failed to achieve that means we will build this babel of uh, this tower of babel and uh, this is not about atheism anymore it is about theocracy yes and we observe this attempt of uh, new attempt of symphony between the state and the church in uh, contemporary Russia. And by the way, the last, the very last, in yesterday news, uh, uh, information about Putin giving uh, Troitsa, Rublev's uh, Trinity, uh, from uh, Tritikov Gallery to uh, Moscow Patriarchate, and uh, Hermitage giving Alexander Nevsky coffin again one ton of silver <laughs> to uh, to the church. It's a kind of uh, very fresh uh, confirmation of this uh, prophecy, you know. And for the many many people, true believers, this what is happening now with the Russian church actually blessing. Uh, the murder of uh, Ukrainian, devastation of Ukrainians, devastation of Ukraine is incredibly painful experience of uh, alienation from, from the church. Because church alienates itself from Christianity. One of the most recent, uh, again, three days ago, a priest was excommun excommunicated because he substituted the word peace for the word victory in one of his prayers, you know about this, yes? So uh, peace becomes dangerous word uh, if you, uh, unlike in Soviet times, if you uh, show the poster peace to the world, you could be jailed, yes? Peace is a provocative, explosive word in today's Russia. Uh, so what we see according to Dostoevsky's uh, prophecy, uh, that uh, the 21st century, with the triumph of the church, triumph of the church, will become much more dangerous for spirituality than the 20th century, when spirituality openly, openly resisted, opposed itself to the kingdom of uh, uh, godless Satan. But uh, we know that uh, in the New Testament, uh, the true Antichrist is not the one who rebels against God, but the one who takes place of God in the church, comes and sits in the church as if he were a God. And this is what happening in contemporary Russia, you know? Not destruction of churches, but usurpation of churches. Uh, this is uh, one of the most visible uh, um, predictions of Dostoevsky uh, most visibly uh, implemented in our days. And uh, another, uh, what you mentioned about uh, Babok, uh, this is a very enigmatic word. Nobody knows uh, uh, <laughs> for sure what it means. And there are uh, investigations on uh, this. Uh, but uh, Babok is about the graveyard where the deceased uh, uh, for several months, they undergo the process of, so to say, mortification, the process of dying, yes? So you could still hear their uh, voices. And these are voices of uh, those who are happy to um, become naked, to overthrow all the civilizational clothes, and uh, to be what they are, uh, uh, de decrepit, uh, uh, decomposing mass of uh, human uh, matter with all of its uh, shameless desires and uh, loss of any morality. And this is what we observe uh, in uh, Russia, especially, I would say, after 2012 uh, with uh, the third term of Putin. Uh, and especially after 2014, you know, it's very quick. And of course, after February 24 of 2022, 
It's a complete degradation of public morality, complete degradation of the state, persecution of the very best minds, of the very uh, best talents, uh, self-destruction of uh, moral, not only political, but moral destruction. When uh, You see, when it was for the first time in Stalin's time, I mean, uh, this denunciation, uh, this information, this... Uh, um, complete uh, uh, mutual uh, destruction of people, even neighbors, even members of the same family, even brothers and uh, fathers who uh, denounced each other for the sake of salvation and died immediately after that also in the hands of uh, uh, OGPU. Uh, this was for the first time, and they believe that it is done for the, they still believe, for the sake of some grand social and political scheme, for the sake of the future. But now, with a repetition of uh, the same uh, tragedy, it becomes a farce, according to uh, famous uh, utterance of, uh, I think it was uh, Hegel and then Marx, uh, that what was uh, first experienced like tragedy, then... Uh, transforms into farce, uh, but uh, it is tr still tragic farce, you know, because uh, people know perfectly well in the last 30 years after the end uh, of uh, the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, all archives were, many archives were published, people read uh, Gulag Archipelago, they know what is it about, and they repeat now shamelessly, shamelessly, you know, without any uh, sociopolitical, Marxist, Leninist uh, uh, motivation, the same scenario of mutual destruction and ultimate self-destruction. And this is terrifying. This is terrifying to see. It, it really is terrifying. And, and, you know, this is, I think, the most important element of, of your book is how beautifully with the with such beautiful clarity you portray really all of this uh, subtextual el um these subtextual elements of what's happening in Russia right now and i'd like to to conclude the interview by asking you one final question and to do so i'd like to quote um from both the first chapter and from your essay uh, a hopeful monster to ask you a little bit about what comes next essentially um, and from the from the first, you you write that the experience of being in the abyss is especially instructive for the outside world. He looks mm -hmm. he only looks into it, and we look out of it. The task of everyone who thinks and writes in Russian and about Russia has acquired new depth. Now all Russianists are involuntarily also non experts, experts in nothing. We are on the front line from whence nothing comes, and no one can know more reliably from whence the threat of the destruction of humanity looms. No one can speak to this abyss in its native language but us. The vocation of Russian studies is now the most important in the world, if only because the catastrophe that sends its threatening signals to the world in, uh, is in a language that we understand. Mm -hmm. And then from, from a hopeful monster, you write, <clears throat> so Russia still has something to hope for. The chances are slim, but they exist, and most importantly, they're not fatal. We are not the past, but the present of the Earth. We do not observe this process paleont paleontologically, but participate in it eschatologically. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the carriers of the Russian cultural genotype themselves to what extent this systemic mutation will be harmful or favorable for this historical organism, for Russia, presumably, mm -hmm. leading to its death or to the creation of a new line of evolution, mm -hmm. quote. And so I, I ask you, um, beyond the roles as, let's say, watchers on the edges of an annihilating zero or genetic mutations of the historical organism, what, if anything, can be done both by those within the cultural, religious, so societal abyss and on the outside of it, on its edges, do to help bring about an end to this annihilating anti-ideology to impregnate the void created by Putin, the Putin ideologues, um, with what is good in light from Russian mm -hmm. culture and thought? What hope is there and how do we accelerate life in the face of this erotic thanatalization that the war is pushing on us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, it's a complicated uh, answer because uh, the essay to which you refer, uh, Fu Fu Monster, was uh, written in 2009 and uh, published in 2011 in Nova Gazeta. So uh, before uh, Putin's return to power. Uh, and even in that essay, uh, and I use uh, biological uh, uh, terms and concepts to explain how even a uh, monster, uh, some violation of basic uh, biological uh, laws can lead to a new form of existence. But when I cite possible examples of such uh, social evolution, I <laughs> mostly uh, resort to uh, consciously to some uh, funny possible circumstances, like, for example, uh, meteorites falling on uh, the Earth, and then precisely this part of uh, the planet, which is Russia, will uh, prosper. Uh, so uh, there were very slim chances. But in the end of uh, this essay, in the new publication, in this book, I uh, make observation that uh, all chances are gone. So what for we should uh, in the past? So what should we hope for if we can uh, uh, cling to some uh, hope? Uh, I think uh, what happened with the Soviet Union uh, can happen uh, with uh, Russia. And uh, I uh, tried to persuade uh, my readers uh, that this would be a good ending uh, of uh, uh, the history of this part of the world in my essay of uh, 1990, uh, which is called On Russia's, in plural, On Russia's. And uh, there is such a section in the book, uh, including this essay and some uh, uh, later uh, interviews. Uh, so I believed at this time, it was even before the collapse of the Soviet Union, when it uh, occurred to me that uh, when we are talking about the democratic outcome for all Russian reforms uh, in the aftermath of communism, we could uh, think about the initial grounds of Russia, which was uh, actually the uh, variety of uh, princehoods, uh, the variety of uh, um, different lands, uh, which uh, enjoyed the independence, though united by language, by faith, I mean, Kievan, uh, Rus, uh, Novgorod, uh, Rus, uh, Rizan, um, Chernigov, uh, Smolensk, and uh, other um, Moscow did exist in, at that time. It emerged uh, late, and actually it uh, emerged uh, as a political power only within uh, the court and actually as a successor of the court. So it's a different line of historical lineage, uh, Moscow and uh, Kiev. Uh, and uh, my assumption was that uh, what is called uh, Russian Federation could uh, transform into European Union, in Rus Russian Union, you see. The union of uh, several Russias uh, that uh, would uh, relate to each other approximately, like the countries uh, relate in the European Union, maybe even uh, more uh, connected because of the commonness of language and uh, uh, commonness of historic uh, heritage. But uh, I would say, and I argued that uh, Russia, even Russia, not only the Soviet Union, which existed at this time in 1990, but Russia itself, Russian Federation, its size, uh, its uh, expense prevents it from being uh, a communicator to other countries surrounding it. You know, it is no, it is uh, it is a political entity of a different scale, which has to be uh, uh, somehow disintegrated in order to enter the integrity of the human species. You know, 
At that time, I thought that it would be a peaceful solution. Now, I don't think that would be a quite peaceful solution, but I hope that this will be the solution, that uh, uh, some uh, disintegrative process within uh, uh, Russia in, uh, would uh, work. And I mean not only uh, between Muslim population and Orthodox population, but I mean uh, Siberia or Far East uh, or uh, uh, St. Petersburg and surrounding area, which could communicate perfectly well with Scandinavian world, for example. Uh, uh, Western parts of Russia, Moscow, Smolensk, uh, Kursk, uh, 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 Belgorod, they could communicate with the Western Europe. Uh, it may be a utopia, but I don't think that any other uh, outcome of the current uh, uh, current uh, bloody confrontation of Russia with the world uh, have uh, more felicitous felicitous uh, uh, conclusion that this disintegration of uh, 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 Russia, which is now actually, and Dmitry Medvedev very recently, uh, so to say, uh, revealed uh, the ultimate truth. What is the skrepa for Russia? Skrepa means bondage, or the bond, what brings Russia together? Uh, the task of uh, finding this Russian skrepa, the tie, the, uh, was advanced again in later Putin uh, period. And it was thought to be anything like patriotism, traditional values, uh, even serfdom, like Nikita Mikhalkov believed that serfdom should be <laughs> the new, uh, so to say, bond uh, bringing Russia together. But Dmitry Medvedev said very clearly, nuclear weapons is Russian scrapper, is what holds Russian together. And uh, this is, of course, terrifying, uh, but uh, it is, he expressed better than I did in the beginning of my book. I say that there are countries that uh, uh, come, come to use, uh, to possess nuclear weapons. But it seems that there may be another way around that nuclear weapons can acquire can get to possess a certain country. And Russia turned out to be this. And Dmitry Medvedev said it very clearly. Yes, that it is nuclear weapons which makes uh, Russia. So as soon as Russia disintegrates the greatest nuclear threat to the world, the threat of self-destruction of uh, the humankind also may decrease or disappear. You see, this is my hope. Thank you very much. It's it's not the most positive of views. But, but uh, positive uh, views can we have really? Right in the face of this satanic, literally the satanic nuclear threat that is that is looming. Um, and so, uh, as, uh, one more footnote to what I said. Uh, in the end of this book, there is such a chapter called "It is Good Prediction." Good prediction. And it is based not on any political or military considerations. It is based on the relationship of uh, the power to language. You know, uh, I noticed, noticed, and it is easy to notice that as soon as Russian rulers uh, began to uh, achieve such a stage of uh, self assurance and, uh, uh, so to say, political pride as to pretend to rule the language. Uh, the end of these rules came in three or four years. Uh, Lenin wrote a famous uh, note about purification of Russian language all of a sudden in the end of uh, civil war. And uh, he died uh, in three or four years. Yes, it, it was a note of 1920. Yes, in the end of civil war, he was triumphant. We, we, <laughs> now we can struggle not only with uh, white God, not only with our political enemies, but we can purify our language. Stalin, 
uh, wrote his big, very much, uh, I would say, uh, uh, monumental uh, work on Marxism and the questions of linguistics in uh, 1950. It was uh, celebrated as the most important in uh, contribution to Marxism, uh, though actually it was denunciation and deconstruction of Marxism. Uh, this can be discussed separately. And he died in three years, in 1953. Khrushchev attempted uh, to uh, arrange uh, orthographic reforms. He was a literate man, and he <laughs> wanted to make orthographic system of Russian easier so that he could write correctly. And so he arranged academic uh, uh, commission in 1961, and he lost his power. He was uh, <clears throat> in three years later, in 1964. And now Putin, immediately after nullification of his presidential terms, which happened in July uh, 2020. In the early August, August 6 of the same year, he created a commission about new codification of Russian language. You know? Uh, <clears throat> and this commission continued to work. Uh, about a, two months ago, there was some new uh, prescriptions uh, and uh, uh, revelations coming from uh, uh, this commission regarding the reform of Russian language. And so in August 2020, I published an article in uh, Nova Gazeta saying that Putin's regime will end in, th in three or four years, according to this uh, <laughs> strange attractor <laughs> that acts in uh, Russian history. So we'll see. According to this prediction, 2023 or 2024 will be the end of Putin regime, based not on, again, political or any other consideration, but a kind of a kind of type of pattern of relationship between the power and language. And language, as Brodsky uh, used to say in his Nobel uh, uh, lecture, is more Asian and more powerful than the state. So we'll see. If <laughs> this time language will turn out to be stronger than the state again. Incredible. So uh, we, wait, we wait to see if the historical process will will continue its path. Well, thank you so much for this just absolutely wonderful and fantastic discussion of your book, which again, um, uh, the Russian here, let me put it up on the screen briefly once again. Um, the Russian anti-world politics on the verge of apocalypse, um, which I hope everyone who watches this video will will go out and and read because it is it is just, it is enlightening and wonderful and brilliant thank you so much Mikhail, for your time for all thank of your you, insight and um we we very greatly appreciate it and um we look forward to speaking to you more from from the initiative and thank you for all of your work that you've done for us and with us um so if you'd like to say anything in conclusion or um i believe we can we can end the interview here uh, thank you uh, peter uh, uh... I think that uh, such uh, conversations uh, being very sad and mournful in a certain way, uh, they still give some hope because uh, they uh, provide some, not only food for thought, but uh, some, uh, some food for uh, inspiration, for uh, energy of action. And this is uh, most important for those who study Russia, because they indeed, they face this nothingness, active nothingness, uh, devouring and self-devouring nothingness. And we have, we need something to oppose it with the activity of our mind and spirit. Precisely. Thank you so much again. And I hope you have a wonderful day and um, I look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.